Hi, I'm the Octopus Lady. You're watching Alien Ocean, and let's talk about dark oxygen today, shall we? So if you haven't heard, there was a paper released recently titled Evidence of Dark Oxygen Production at the Abyssal Sea Floor, and it kind of got everyone's attention, myself included. The basic rundown is a bunch of researchers sailed out into an area of the ocean called the CCZ, or the Clarion Clipperton Zone, and measured oxygen levels along the abyssal plain, which is this flat area of the sea floor that's about 3,000 to 6,000 meters below. But these researchers were doing their study at around 4,000 meters below. And there, in the oppressive crushing darkness that is the bottom of the ocean, they discovered dark oxygen production, or DOP. Now, what the heck is dark oxygen? Is it some sort of aesthetic, like dark academia? Is it the twisted, mirrored version of regular oxygen, kind of like Superman and Bizarro? Is it like dark matter? Whatever dark matter is? I don't know what dark matter is because I don't study physics because I'm not a nerd. Well, it's none of that. Quite simply, dark oxygen is molecular oxygen, or O2, that is produced through non-photosynthetic means, which might not sound very exciting, but this is a big deal. Almost all molecular oxygen on this planet is produced through photosynthesis and therefore requires sunlight. But famously, there is no sunlight at the bottom of the ocean. So what's going on here? Let's break this study down. First off, how did they even figure out that DOP was happening at the ocean floor? Well, they measured it. That's basically it. They pushed a bunch of chambers into the ocean floor sediment to, quote, create an enclosed microcosm of the sea floor. And then there were little devices in the chambers that took measurements of oxygen levels at regular intervals over a set period of time. And from that, they saw that oxygen levels went up, as you can see in these graphs. What's funny is they weren't actually in the CCV to study dark oxygen production. They didn't even know DOP was occurring there. They were there to study sediment community O2 consumption, or SC. OC, which is the rate at which organisms that live in seafloor sediment consume oxygen. So they were expecting O2 levels to go down, not up. And they were so baffled by their data that they were convinced that their oxygen measuring devices were broken. But they weren't. They were working just fine. So this led to the next question. There's something producing oxygen down there. What's producing oxygen down there? And the researchers are pretty sure it's these polymetallic nodules, which are lumpy potato-sized rocks composed of different kinds of metals that are scattered all over the place. Now this is a weird thought, right? Because lumpy metallic rocks aren't alive and most oxygen produced on Earth is from alive things. So how do we know O2 is coming from the nodules and not from anything else? Which is a good question. A huge chunk of this paper is the researchers going through all the different reasons why they think the oxygen is being produced by the nodules, but I'm not going to summarize all of that here. I'm just going to summarize the ones I think are the most interesting. There have been reports of microbes that live in sunless places that are capable of producing dark oxygen, so maybe there were microbes in the sediment that were responsible. But when the researchers examined samples of sediment taken from within the test chambers, they found toxic levels of mercury chloride. So if there were any microbes, they were dead. Well, maybe some gas bubbles from the surface got trapped in the chambers, and that's where the oxygen was coming from. But that is not possible because there were one-way valves on the chambers that released air as they sunk. And quote, even if an air bubble could be trapped long enough to reach the sea floor, gaseous diffusion of O2 into the water phase would take less than one second at 4,000 meters depth, which means we would see a spike in O2 levels on these graphs and not this steady increase. And then finally, they did some testing in a lab and not in the ocean, where one of the experiments they did was just chucking some nodules and water into a bucket and left it in a dark room for a few days. They measured O2 levels at the start of the experiment and then at the end of the experiment, and sure enough, the oxygen levels increased over that period of time in the nodule bucket. That's so much fun to say. The next question was, how are the nodules doing this? And the answer might be electrolysis. And I don't really want to explain what electrolysis is because I'm trying to keep this video short, but it's basically using electricity to force a chemical reaction that normally wouldn't happen on its own. When you send an electrical current through water specifically, that causes water molecules to split into H2, hydrogen gas, and O2, oxygen gas. If you want a more detailed explanation of electrolysis, I like Fuse School's brief overview of it and Tyler DeWitt's longer overview of it. But long story short, to do electrolysis, you need a source of energy. 
energy, which potentially could be coming from the nodules themselves. They might be acting like batteries. When the researchers measured the electrical potentials of different nodules they collected, they found some that were as high as 0.95 volts, which is apparently almost as high as a AA battery and may be enough to split water. Maybe. It depends on a bunch of things, including the composition of the nodules themselves. A nodule that contains certain kinds of metals might only need 0.95 volts of electricity to do electrolysis, but a nodule that contains certain kinds of other metals might need more energy or less. They don't really know yet, the researchers need to do more investigating. Also, the amount of surface area that's exposed on a nodule seems to affect the amount of O2 that gets produced. You see how on the graphs there's a steady increase of DOP and then it levels off. The researchers think this is because the lander that they used to set up the chambers might have blown a bunch of sediment off the nodules and therefore increased the amount of surface area that was in contact with the water, which could have resulted in a bunch of electrolysis happening and therefore a bunch of dark oxygen getting produced, causing this initial steady increase of O2. And then it levels off as the nodules, for lack of a better phrase, get used up. This is an oversimplification, but you know, try to think of it in a similar way to how a battery gets used up when you use it to do a bunch of electrical things. If if the nodules are in fact acting like batteries and are splitting water through electrolysis. This is just a hypothesis, they don't know for sure. These researchers just discovered DOP at the bottom of the ocean, they're not going to have all the answers to all the questions, especially when they weren't even looking for dark oxygen production in the first place. So when I was first reading this paper, I was thinking to myself, man, what sort of implications does this discovery have for like how Earth became oxygenated? Because for a good chunk of this planet's existence, there wasn't a ton of O2 around, and it wasn't until it showed up that we started to see evidence of multicellular life here on Earth. So these nodules, are they the reason we're here, breathing what we're breathing right now? And then I was like, wait, yo, could nodules like these on other planets maybe help create the conditions needed to facilitate life? And then I was like, wait, do these nodules mean that the hydrothermal vents are actually, truly independent from the sun? If you're confused about that last one, go watch my video about the hydrothermal vents. But then I found out that these nodules only form in highly oxygenated water, so they're not the reason we have so much O2 on this planet which is a bit of a bummer, but that doesn't mean that these nodules aren't currently extremely important. I know when you look at a picture like this, it seems like we're just looking at a bunch of dirt and rocks, but this is actually an ecosystem. Animals live here, many of which we've never seen before and are completely new to science. And they're all under threat because of deep sea mining. There are companies that want to harvest the nodules so they can turn them into actual batteries that we can use in electric cars and stuff, but we only have a vague idea of what what sort of role these nodules play in this ecosystem. And we should probably figure that out before we start ganking them and doing what is most likely irreparable harm to these creatures and their home. I could make a whole separate video about deep sea mining, but honestly, that's probably never going to happen because the whole topic just makes me really sad. And I don't think I have the mental fortitude to let it be the focus of my attention for the several weeks it takes me to make a video. And even if I did, it would probably just end up being a less good version of last week tonight's segment about deep sea mining that came out a few months ago, which I thought was really well done. So go check that out if you want to learn more. But if you're interested in deep sea exploration in general, then I highly recommend the video The Raising of the Titanic, which is a fascinating video about the disastrous 1996 attempt to raise a piece of the Titanic to the surface, which is available on my streaming service Nebula right now. Nebula is a prestige streaming platform that hosts some of your favorite content creators like Chubby Emu, Tirzu, and and me. It's the place where we can make thoughtful, high quality videos and you don't have to worry about things like clickbait or ads. It's like Netflix, but for people who like trains. We also have plenty of content you can't see anywhere else, what we like to call our Nebula Originals, which includes things like Bobby Broccoli's upcoming documentary, 17 Pages. But while you're waiting for that to come out, you can watch Neo's Nebula Original, The Raising of the Titanic. It's all about how a company back in 1996 tried to, well, raise a part of the Titanic and how it all went completely wrong. 
strong. It's a pretty fascinating look into how to bring something huge and heavy up from the deep ocean, and whether we should even be messing around with the Titanic in the first place. To get a yearly Nebula subscription for 40% off at $36 a year or $3 a month, head over to go.nebula.tv slash the octopus lady, or use my link in the description. You can also get a monthly plan for $6 a month, or even a lifetime membership for only $300, meaning you pay $300 once and then you have access to Nebula forever. Regardless of which way you decide to sign up, your support will directly help me and other creators like me continue to make fascinating and high quality content for you. And with that, thanks for watching another episode of Alien Ocean. I want to give a special shout out to my fellow Nebulite? Nebulin? Fellow person on Nebula, Jordan Herod. There were some parts of this paper that really confused me, and she was kind enough to take time out of her day to explain those confusing parts to me. So thanks again, Jordan. Go check out her channel, either here on YouTube or on Nebula. I've linked to both of them below. I also want to thank other fellow Nebulian? Real Engineering for letting me use some clips from their video about deep sea mining, which I've also linked to down below. And last, but certainly not least, I gotta give another special shout out, as always, to my patrons. Thank you so much for your support. Y'all are the best. If you'd like to become a patron of mine, which can give you early access to my videos or your name in the beautiful credits, you can sign up using the link in the description. You can also check me out over on Twitter as well, and be sure to like, share, and subscribe, and all that. And until next time, this is your friendly neighborhood octopus lady reminding you that you don't have to go into space to find aliens.